Well, good morning. Welcome to the second panel of our 2023 GenMonet European Center Annual Conference on Approaches to Migration, Asylum and Rights in Europe and Beyond. And my name is Alain Tokyo I'm a PhD candidate here at FIU in International Relations, and I'm the graduate assistant of the GenMonet Center. So well, I'm very happy to be here. We have been working a lot for this event. Um, the goal of this conference is to address these three categories, migration, asylum, and race, from diverse perspectives. This panel focuses on the legal and policy aspects of migration and asylum in the US, and also from a transatlantic and comparative perspective. When we invited these three fantastic speakers, experts, uh, whom I'll introduce uh, in some moments, we posted a question. What are the most relevant political and legal aspects that we have been decided, that, sorry, that have been decided or should be addressed in the European Union and beyond on migration, asylum, and rights? So this final time aims to answer this question from diverse perspectives. Talking about the importance of law and policy for migrants and refugees is probably a truism. However, the complexities of the legal and policy approaches to migration and asylum in the global north are multiple and multidimensional. Just a very simple example. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights established that human rights are universal, indivisible, and inalienable. In this regard, Article 14 reads, everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. However, this is one of the Declaration's more regulated, probably constrained articles. We all have the right to enjoy, to seek and enjoy asylum, but the state, through its laws and policies, holds power to define whether I'm persecuted or not, whether my country of origin is dangerous or not, etc., etc., in, in a few words, whether I can enjoy that right that is supposed to be universal. Three outstanding scholars are here to shed light on diverse dimensions of um, the importance of law and policy at the intersections of migration, asylum, and race. Please join me in welcoming Professor Juan Carlos Gomez, Dr. Joyce de Cornick, and Dr. Yeva Yedra. I could, uh, <laughs> so please. <laughs> so, our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Juan Carlos, uh, sorry, Professor Juan Carlos Gomez. Professor Gomez has been defending the rights of individuals in migration uh, matters for over 30 years. During this time, he has represented persons before the United States Courts of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, as well as the United States Departments of Justice and Homeland Security in complex immigration individuals in situations including removal and deportation proceedings family immigration, and the transfer of professionals and executives in the United States. Professor Gomez counsels international and national corporations <coughs> sorry, on compliance with immigration laws. He also coordinated teams of attorneys in multi-forum conflicts to effectively resolve clients' problems. As an attorney, for a Central American Refugee Project, he helped in the representation of thousands of individuals in the southeastern United States in a national class action. He has, been, he has represented refugees from every part of the world where there have been conflicts over the last three decades. As director of East Little Havana Legal Services, he led a team of attorneys to resolve the series of problems faced by clients. Professor Gomez earned his JD from the University of Pennsylvania. He also holds a BA with honors in political science and history 
from Florida International University. Professor Gomez, the floor of this course. It's really funny, that's my obituary picture. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I always freak out when people start reading this because I'm usually looking to see if I'm in an urn or a box. <laughs> depending on my family member who gets there first. It's a, it's a, it's a shoebox. Uh, thank you all for the invitation. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, I had a break, and instead of court, I got to come here. Uh, and it, it's very illustrative because people don't understand the value of a continuance, uh, and that buying time is in a defensive posture is actually, when the law is unjust, when the situation is unjust, um, you resolve it. One of my oldest clients, uh, Galileo Galilee, uh, has not written to me or emailed me or texted me in centuries, uh, and I don't mind. Uh, we will get a decision one day, and I always tell my clients, uh, listen, uh, if they set the hearing for 2098, schedule is open. Are you available? Think about it. We are not going to get a fair decision today. Now, that said, there's some things I, I wanted to share uh, with you all. And uh, part of it is that this situation is definitely, in a legal sense and a political sense, in a human, and a human, and a human way, not monolithic. It is extraordinarily complex. And there are so many different perspectives. Um, one of the things that I'd like to clarify always at the beginning is language. Uh, for example, there's the use of, of the lay sense of immigration and migration. And then there's the sort of sociological and political science uh, or economic definition of concepts related to migration. But the word migrant was used in the years that I've been dealing with as a way of de-refugizing uh, refugees. Because if you call someone a refugee, then all of a sudden you trigger certain rights. Whereas if you are, if, if the person is just a migrant in the process of migrating, then they don't have the same standing. Because countries that are signatories and that often <laughs> say that they are implementing uh, the concepts of or protection systems related to refugee law, uh, it's, it's not exactly, uh, it's, it's not easy. A refugee is also subject to a quota. A refugee is a person outside their country of nationality or habitual residence who fears and refuses to or objects to returning to their country because either the government, someone the government controlled, someone the government does not control, someone the government chooses to not control, has persecuted or has persecuted people similarly situated or will persecute in that it is that they have an objective fear or should have an objective fear that they would be persecuted based on their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, or their particular social group, just so that you can get a sense of absurdity. Um, there's a case called Elias Zacharias uh, versus INS, and it's a Justice Scalia case. Uh, and I say this because he wrote the majority. And the answer is, if a guerrilla fighter during the Guatemalan Civil War showed up at your house in the middle of the night with an AK, the number you want, uh, and told you, you're gonna go fight with me, uh, if you said, oh, I need to take care of my children, I need to, I'm afraid, um, I, need, I, I, I just can't go, that's, not acceptable to qualify for asylum. You would only qualify for asylum if you said, uh, can we have a conversation? I'm opposed. At what point do you think the bullet flew out of the chamber? At what point do you think this person is dead? So there's sort of the law, there is politics, and so there's a certain disconnect between law and politics and the reality of individuals. Most of when of talking about obituaries, I have a joke, uh, and you'll see that uh, part of, I hope that my presentation includes jokes that you will 
laptop. Uh, if not, my therapist, Jack, uh, will be very upset after the presentation because he'll have to listen to me whine about, did you see that the audience didn't laugh? And so clients, and by that I mean individuals, are not concerned about law and politics and what we discuss, but they are concerned about, can you get me my little car? Can you get me my work permit? So my joke is that the day that I die, the only people who will show up will be my clients to say, you know how he keeps the mail in his car and the files in his car? You don't happen to have seen an envelope with my name on it and a little car because that's what really matters. I don't know how many times we have been in court, my colleagues and I, and the client comes, wait, wait, you're angry in the court. And I go, yes, yes, we are. Uh, and we will, and we're going to say whatever we're going to say. And as a matter of fact, we're probably going to go have coffee with the judge afterwards. But in the meantime, we're going to have a fight about what your rights are. No, no, please don't anger the judge. That's in a bottle. No, no, we don't want to send a bottle. We're going to federal prison if we do that. Uh, don't give gifts over $25 to any government official. <laughs> that's our uh, so the issue is there's a misunderstanding, there's a disconnect. And one of the questions becomes in terms of legitimacy of information is that in our world of people out in the field, and I'm sure that you all have the same sense, is that the cartels, the human traffickers, the smugglers, have had a better effort in marketing and in messaging than have NGOs that have had that, that religious organizations and that have had governments out there. Because the question is, who can solve my problem? Now, I want you to think of this also in terms of language. The reason why you have such complex language in terms of the refugee definition uh, is that, by the way, it's not enough, because then you also have this other form of protection referred to as withholding of removal, and then you have this other form of protection called Convention Against Torture, withholding of removal, or deferral of removal. <coughs> and it becomes really complex, because people go, I don't understand. Um, and the question is, wait, my problem happened several years ago, why can't I go see my relatives? And the answer is, well, there's a difference between refugees, asylees, because asylees are people who arrive in the US and they apply for asylum. The reason you have the border crisis that you have is because of a mix of situations where we do not return people without having process. But at one point, what happens is that the machines themselves do not function. The machines there aren't enough lawyers out there to represent people in Europe or here or to advise people. And then there's a level of mistrust because the question is, you as a lawyer are not with me. If you're charging me, it's because you want my money. If you're not charging me, I'm not sure if I can trust you. Are you paid by the government? You see? Uh, and then, there's this other issue of, wait, but my cousin said, or my aunt said. And so one of the things that you will discover is that a large sector of the population that we represent in the immigrant rights community is actually anti-immigrant, except for my loved ones, <laughs> or people like me, but not the other ones, not, th not those other people. Or there's also what I refer to as generational conflicts in that, oh, when I came, there was a civil war in my country. Now, these people are coming for other reasons. And so you have those tensions. You have racial tensions. You have uh, gender tensions. You have all sorts of factors that make it difficult to have a unified front on the advocacy side. Now, think of this not just in terms of the United States, but think of it in terms of Canada, Australia, 
in the European Union, where the question is you have the advocacy community, you have the advocacy community divided between lawyers, activists, and service providers. Service providers often find themselves on the short end and field workers find themselves also on the short end because of issues like ongoing resources. So that the government will provide a person identified as qualifying for assistance X amount of months of services. And then the question is, well, what do you do when you continue to need those services? What happens if you as a lawyer take a case, and the case is going to take four years, but the funding for the lawyers who you had only covered two years? What do you do then? Understanding that then the question is, in terms of service providers, is that you are, you are in a very difficult situation to manage. Because the thing is, there's the individual case, there is the group case in that, I'll give you here in South Florida, we have four populations that are, that are significant. Haitian, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan, and Cuban. Theoretically, would have consistent issues, not the case, and the problem is that there is no unity in the effort. There is also no unity with other types of civil liberties and human rights, understanding that for those of us in the US, we use the term civil liberties in terms of constitutional rights. And in the European or global sense, the word human rights is sort of broader in a sense. But in the US, we have a much narrower sense of rights. That said, there is this complete distinction out there of advocacy groups. Whereas the anti-immigrant organizations, all they have to do is obstruct. All they have to do is demonize and dehumanize. Because the thing is that you have regular migration in the sense of people, in people of countries like the US give priority to family-based immigration than employment-based immigration, understanding that with all due respect, one of the concerns that like I have related to temporary workers is that it leads to exploitation and that it leads to, it meets the needs of certain employers, but then what about the employee? And, we, and we've seen it with the H2A, those agricultural workers, and so this is a problem because then there's a setting of rules. And then there's the question of how do you manage that? And then there's the issue of temporary protected status, which helps temporarily but it sort of leaves people in a semi limbo <coughs> And so what do you do about that? And so you have this extra level of tension that exists because the question is when you fail to produce, and I, I'm going to try to sort of close out with, in 1986 there was a reform of immigration laws. In 1990 there was a reform of the 86 reform. In 1996 there was a reaction to the 86 and the 90 reforms. In 2002, there was further reaction based on 9-11, and so the creation of Homeland Security was created, what happened. And then in 2005, even more security based. There have been no favorable major reforms because if you use the example of legislation efforts or legislative efforts at the end of last year, everybody was for themselves and for no one else. Dreamers were for themselves, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. The dreamers were for themselves and not for others. The Indian and Chinese lobbies were for themselves and no one else. And the agricultural industry was for itself and no one else. And so they were unable to get anything done because the center was unable to produce practical steps. And that's the problem. How do we handle this in a practical situ in a practical way to address tweaks that have to happen here and there to avoid systems imploding? Because in the end, that person who gets the work permit is the one who is hurt when systems fall apart. So this is cool. This is a
my family. They only tell me they did this. My mother used to do that with me as a child. Like one minute, shut up. Uh, it's my own weight. Uh, do you know what the clerk at the 11th Circuit, the red light is on, the red light is on, Mr. Goldman. So, okay. So, there's this one other thing. I want you to think of these populations. Marginal populations in terms of human rights reporting. You have vulnerable populations, young women, in source countries. Do not tell me that also, do not romanticize home countries because I am tired of the abuse of young women. During the Guatemalan Civil War, we ignored, and I continue saying it, domestic violence problems, so that today we still have an oppressive sexist system where women are not protected. Homophobia, the LGBTQI community, is targeted in most of these source countries. You have mentally ill, uh, individuals, people with different mental disabilities, people with different di physical disabilities. You have religious minorities, uh, and you, you have race and ethnic, racial and ethnic minorities that are targeted. Most of the traditional human rights reporting organizations, which is work that has been important for academic sources and for reporting sources, do not address these adequately. Because then governments react to quickly say, oh, it is economic. Whatever country is doing its best to help, that's bullshit, pardon me. Um, that is nonsense. They are not doing that. They are playing the game of language and saying, and I'll say it with a Pan American Health Organization, oh, this Honduras is not persecuting the severely mentally ill. Honduras is doing the best it can. To help, whatever. That's nonsense. Because then it becomes not that the government, but that somebody else might have killed a schizophrenic who was unmedicated. And the question is how do you create the resources to be able to get national advocacy, international advocacy for these vulnerable populations? Okay, thank you. Please try the motion. introduce you, uh, Joyce de Cornic, Dr. Joyce de Cornic. Joyce is a postdoctoral researcher affiliated with Ghent University and scholar in residence at the Center of Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU Law School. She is currently working on developing a model of relational human rights responsibility to effectively apportion human rights responsibility stemming from transnational cooperative governance involving state actors, international organizations, and private co corporations. Joyce holds a Master's of Law from Ghent University and a Master of Law in International and European Law for the Institute uh, for European Studies, Free University of Brussels and obtained her doctoral degree at Ghent University, titled Catch-22, in the law of responsibility of legal of international organizations, systemic deficiencies in the EU responsibility paradigm for unlawful human rights conduct in integrated border management. Joyce has subsequently selected, <coughs> sorry, Joyce was subsequently selected as an Emil Noel Fellow at the Gemonet Center of New York University. Additionally, she has positions as an adjunct professor of EU law at Minnesota Law School, as a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam, as well as the University of Leiden. Finally, she has regularly been invited to provide guest lectures, including <laughs> the College of Europe, New York University, Loyola University, in the realm of international human rights law, EU law, and law governing asylum, borders, and migration. Dr. Koenig, the floor is yours. What 
such an introduction. I'm sorry you have to listen to all of that. Um, so a quick show of hands. Well, no, first and foremost, thank you for the invitation. I'm very, very thrilled to be here. It's really interesting to get uh, political science perspectives and other perspectives generally, uh, given that I am a lawyer, so it might get a little bit technical today. I apologize for that. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as indicated, my focus uh, in my research to date has been on the interplay uh, of border management with human rights, so what you were referring to as civil liberties, etc. in the U.S., human rights more generally on a global scale. Now, a quick show of hands, who was here yesterday for the keynote? Okay, so do you remember at some point um, there was reference made to how European uh, regulation on border management, asylum and migration, should focus on moving the EU's external border to third countries. Right. So while I agree to a certain extent that we have to be more creative about border management, what about the next question? And this is a question that I'd like you to keep in mind as we progress through this somewhat technical presentation. What happens when you move the border, the external border, into third countries? where there's um, a flagrant record of flagrant human rights violations. And I'm talking specifically today about Libya, which is widely documented to enslave individuals, commit sexual abuse, uh, torture, kill, etc., starve individuals. What happens in that scenario? And I guess the main argument that I'm making today is that if we're going to externalize or move the external border of the EU further into third countries, as well as what could possibly happen in the US, right? If we're gonna do that, that has to be accompanied or aligned with a human rights system that accommodates that movement. So just keep that in mind as we go along. The main message, I think, of EU border management in my research, uh, at least is what I uh, found, um, is that what we'll do is we'll do everything to keep you out. We'll, do, we'll go through great lengths in practice and in theory to keep you out, but once you're in, in theory, and this was an interesting conversation that I had yesterday, in theory at least, from a legal perspective, will protect you better than anybody else or any other region in the world. Whether that happens in practice, that's something that I can't address uh, within the ambit of this particular presentation, but the main message thus being, we'll keep you out as much as possible. And this keeping you out uh, dynamic stems from the politicization and weaponization of otherness. And this is a really interesting conversation, again, yesterday that we've had and otherness uh, relates to, amongst others, race, nationality, <laughs> physical proximity, um, and religion, among others. And a beautiful example, in a morbid sense, is what's happening on the polish belarusian border. We have, on the one hand, individuals coming from Afghanistan and Syria who are fleeing um, armed conflict, who are being kept in no man's land between Poland and Belarus, and that are literally starting to death. And we have, on the other hand, we have Ukrainian individuals fleeing also armed conflict, who are, thanks to the Temporary Protection Directive, being permitted into the European Union through expedited procedures. And I'm not, I'm not claiming anything in particular. I'm, I'm saying that it's noticeable, or noteworthy at least, that there's this difference of treatment of individuals, and that this relates to the factors that we take into consideration when looking at otherness. But that's not the focus of my presentation today. The focus of my presentation today is what happens or how this otherness translates into concrete uh, border management measures of the EU. And so there's three characteristics uh, that are usually named when we're talking about border management in the EU. Namely, that we're moving towards securitization of the EU's external border, which means that Frontex, that was mentioned yesterday, I think, Frontex increasingly has uh, the ability to hold arms, etc., take operational measures in effectuating border management policies. We have externalization, which means that we're externalizing border control to third countries through visa arrangements, through return agreements with third countries. We have militarization. So what you see is that increasingly the EU is relying on military operations in order to securitize, for example, the Mediterranean. So we have a military operation called Operation Sophia, which was uh, succeeded by um, Operation Irini, which is purportedly meant to uh, ensure that the Mediterranean stays free, free of smugglers um, and human trafficking, but is actually being used for the purpose of migration management and border management. And to those three characteristics, I'd like to add a, third, a fourth one, namely the hybridization of border management. 
what do I mean by hybridization? And this is truly the focal point of my research currently. What I refer to is transnational cooperative governance. And that refers to the cooperation between international organizations such as the EU with states together with private corporations. So you've got this beautiful mesh of public and, and private entities working together, coming together to tackle this notion of or tackle border management issues, let's say. So you've got a muddling of the public and the private divide where increasingly private corporations are turned to to help effectuate these public functions of border management, right? And the, the element of transnationalism comes in when you're then relying upon, for example, focal point of today, US-based companies that are providing assistance to Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard, in assisting the member states in their border management of the EU's external border. Are we still following? Yeah. Okay, perfect. When it gets too uh, technical, please raise your hand and I'll try to backtrack a little bit. So um, what you see conclusively is that through transnational cooperative governance, we're moving away from the state-centric uh, conceptualization of border management <laughs> in the direction of something hybrid, i.e. hybridization of border management. Two examples that I'd like to look at today. Um, the first one being this Operation Sophia, where initially, within the context of Operation Sophia, they were using naval uh, built vessels on the Mediterranean in order to conduct surveillance, right? But fairly quickly into Operation Sophia, they moved into aerial surveillance using first planes and then drones. Now, I mean, I, I know, you know, this is a presentation setting, but I'd like to ask, uh, what would be the benefit of using drones instead of naval vessels? Does anybody want to give it a go? Cheaper. Maybe. I hadn't even looked at that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Just scream it out. I think you minimize the risk for the loss of lives. How? Because drones can be operated, operated remotely. But how would that mitigate the risk of life? The better technology. Okay. I saw him there too. Yeah. Well, I am my only thing going off uh, is so when you're operating a drone, you can be thousands of miles away. What we're taking off, right? But with Navy vessels, you're on the ship. So that's, that's what I'm like bouncing off in. But what I so, like yeah, I'll, I'll bring them both together. If, to a certain extent, what happens when you have a vessel encountering a boat within the context of international and European law is that as soon as you're in physical proximity of the individuals, law, be it maritime law on an international level, or European human rights law, or international human rights law, requires you to abide by your human rights obligations. So if I'm in physical proximity of somebody, and I have physical control that I'm exercising over that individual, I'll be obliged under international law and European law to provide assistance. Whereas if you're operating a drone for God, from God knows how far away, you don't actually trigger that obligation. All right? So, I'm going to add an element of complication to this. Um, drones within the context of Operation Sophia and Operation Irini have been used to monitor the high seas. So legally speaking, high seas are not part of national territory of any particular state. What happens when you're trying to externalize EU border management and you're in high seas? <laughs> you still have this potential link between the individual on high seas and your obligations under international human rights law. So what you want to do, from the perspective of these states and the EU, et cetera, is externalize even more and push the external EU border back into the country, such as Libya. How do you do that when you're only operating drones in the high seas? Because you're not allowed to operate drones technically in the airspace of Libya, for example, right? And that brings me to <coughs> my newest little uh, project, um, the cooperation of Hawkeye 360, a uh, company that you might all be uh, familiar with, um, and the EU, so Frontex and its member states. And so what happens within the context of this cooperation, or what could happen, because I mean, all of this information is confidential and I don't have access to it, but my intuition is that they're using Hawkeye as a means to um, access data sources that Hawkeye provides through its uh, satellite clusters, which are not in the airspace of Libya, to um, detect when individuals are trying to leave the territory of Libya. So you've got your external border, which is quite effectively moving into Libyan territory. Are you still following? So because we're dealing with satellites, you can monitor movement of individuals trying to move towards Europe, 
before they even left the country, right? Okay, so um, backtracking a little bit, um, what does this result into? Human rights violations, potential human rights violations, and more, more specifically, based on yesterday's presentation, the right to leave one's country, but also the no less and more principle that was just discussed. I don't know what it's called in the US, he said it's the- uh, Not return. Not return. So what that pretty much means is you cannot send individuals back to a place where they're uh, at risk of being subjected to significant ill treatment. Now there's various conceptualizations of that, but you can see how preventing individuals from leaving a country where they will be tortured, enslaved, um, you know, sexually abused, etc., that might violate the no criminal principle. And so that brings me to how do you hold a particular entity legally responsible for human rights violations or contributing to human rights violations? You need four conditions, generally speaking. You would have to have jurisdiction, which pretty much means that your human rights obligations would have to have been triggered. So this should remind you of the physical proximity concept that I just uh, explained. Two, there has to be attribution. So you have to be able to link the conduct to a particular <laughs> entity. Three, there has to be an identifiable, uh, identifiable unlawful act. And then four, there has to be causality between the act and the damage that was incurred. Now, so what's crucial about the human rights regime, generally speaking, be it on an international level or a European level, is that it was always enacted, interpreted, and applied vis-a-vis -vis states. It was never intended or has not yet been developed to take into account these hybrid forms of cooperation where you have private entities working together with international organizations, working together with states. So why is that relevant? Because in every single one of these conditions, you'll note when you apply them in practice that they're not developed to take this type of hybrid form of cooperation into account, as a result of which you actually create a responsibility gap. The individuals that are being pushed back, according to the traditional human rights regime, will not be able to hold the states that are <coughs> in this responsible, they will not be able to hold the EU responsible for it, and they will not be able to hold the private corporations responsible for these pushbacks or consensual containment, let's say. Okay, um, so um, applying that in practice, um, what happens with Hawkeye 360 is that we have these satellite clusters that are making four sources of data available to Frontex, which allows Frontex, as they did with Operation Sophia, to then transmit or communicate those location data of those individuals trying to leave Libya or on the high seas to the Libyan Coast Guard. The Libyan Coast Guard can then push and pull individuals back into their territory insofar they have even managed to leave and then subject them to whatever treatment uh, as they please. How does that translate to these four conditions? Jurisdiction, first and foremost, because we're in the territory of Libya or on high seas, it's very unlikely that your human rights obligations, which have traditionally been enacted, interpreted, and applied to states, will apply extraterritorially. Crucially, human rights as it exists today are obligations that a state has towards its individuals within its own territory. So as soon as you're moving into high seas or into the territory of another country, those human rights obligations are not triggered. There are nuances there, but for the purposes of today, that's probably the most crucial takeaway. Attribution. Technically, um, attribution has been developed to attribute conduct to a state. We don't actually know what the tests are. There are no conclusive tests to be able to attribute unlawful human rights conduct or complicity in unlawful human rights conduct to international organizations or companies or states when we're dealing with these hybrid forms of cooperation. Then three, can we really say when we're trying to determine unlawful conduct under international human rights law that passing on of data from one entity, from a private corporation to Frontex, for example, is in and of itself a human rights violation? Under the traditional regime, that's not the case. Um, entailing that your third cumulative condition has also not been met. Fourth condition, causality. Under EU law at the moment, for the EU to be held responsible for contributing to human rights violations, 
there would have to be a causal connection with no intervening act of any entity whatsoever in order for that conduct to be attributed to the EU and result in responsibility. Now, because you're dealing with hybrid forms of cooperation, you will inevitably have an intervening act by Hawkeye 360, by the member states, by the Libyan Coast Guard, for example, as a result of which you would never be able to hold the EU as an entity responsible for contributing to that human rights violation. So all in all, um, in answer to the question that was asked of this panel, what is one of the most pressing things that would need to be addressed within the context of uh, border <laughs> management, asylum, and migration in the EU, my personal opinion would be that you would have to tackle the human rights regime as it has been developed and account for hybrid forms of cooperation so that the individual whose rights are being violated will effectively have somebody to point the finger at when their, when their rights have been violated. I think that, that, that does it for me. Um, oh, maybe not. This is the teaser. This is the paper that I actually wanted to present, but I thought it might be a bit too technical. The way forward, in my opinion, would be relational human rights responsibility, where you don't, where you redevelop the obligations that you have under international human rights, so that they can also be attached to international organizations and private corporations, but in relation to each other. You can't look at human rights obligations siloed or IOs on the one hand, businesses on the other hand, and then states <laughs> completely aside from that. You would have to align them with each other in order to close any responsibility gaps that are currently arising. So that, that's it for today. Thank you. Luis for this fantastic presentation. Well, we have uh, addressed some aspects about the, the US and now the, the European Union. So our next speaker will uh, address this in transnational, transatlantic and comparative perspective. Uh, before I introduce her, I mean, after her presentation, we are going to have the questions and answer session. So be ready to make questions. I have a lot, but you are the ones who have to post your questions, take them notes, and so we can engage in a very interesting discussion. So let me introduce you, Dr. Yeva Yedraitite. <laughs> where uh, she holds a master's in Latin American studies from Barcelona University and a PhD in political science from the Unions University. Uh, she has nine years of experience in research and teaching. She also spent several years working as a trainee for different EU development co cooperation, cooperation bodies, including the EU delegation in Honduras. Her research interests are EU external action with a focus on development cooperation, Latin American studies with a focus on Central America, and the formation of global and regional borders. Currently, she is a Fulbright Scholar at the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies at, Amer at the American University in Washington, D.C. Yeva is working on a project comparing the regional orders that the EU's, EU and the U.S. attempt to build in their southern neighborhoods. Here, Yeva. So I'm working with that, I can finish, uh, and we can go home. Uh, no, I am going to present today, and I'll try not to talk too quick, because I realize I put too much into the presentation as the first mistake of a lecture, uh, is my ongoing, my ongoing research a little bit framed through the lens of migration, because I'm actually interested in ordering. I'm interested in the ways how powerful actors try to order others and what are the ways to understand that. So I'll show you a little bit how I did that for the EU and US. Uh, and I applied the way of thinking or the question uh, to the EU and US engagement with their southern neighbors. And I put it in the context of migration crisis. 
Because actually migration flows, especially from the South, are afraid as continuous crisis. And those who live in the US, you, 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 you are totally aware of that. So today, I would like to talk about sort of three parts. So my research question, and then two ways I answer to it. Looking at regional order as a story that we tell, and looking at the regional orders as a structure <coughs> that we build. So a little bit bear with me until I reach the migration. <laughs> We're far from that yet. But what I found very interesting as a person working for the European Union in Latin America, and also as a, someone that reads literature, especially about the border, that both, on the one hand, both Europe, European countries, European Union, and the US are lumped together as the West, and often criticized from the South uh, in terms of being you know, hegemonic, <laughs> imperial, uh, imposing their models on others, etc., etc. And while the European Union is not a state, it has been often described as empire, similar to like the US, just with adjectives, so empire with adjectives. Empire by example, empire that's soft, empire that's smart, but still empire. At the same time, there is this debate that got especially loud after the war in Iraq, beginning of the war of Iraq, where we oppose those two actors, one against each other, saying, oh, there's this American empire, and there is this normative power in Europe. That's good, that's cool, that's software, and I do work in Central America for the youth that would say, you know, yeah, we we the West, but we're not America. Quality to it, better ones, softer ones, etc. Et so that was the constructivist approach. And the realist, I don't know if you ever heard about Robert Kagan, but there was this uh, famous book about the Americans being from Mars and Europeans being from Venus. It's about security cultures and about how soft and powerful they are. And wait, where is my slide? So it has way into many cartoons where European Union is shown as this, you know, feminine, the whole gender reading there, soft, you know, more civilized maybe, et cetera, et cetera, or simply as weaker than the US. And from what I'm interested in, from the perspective of comparative regionalism and region, the authors offer the concept of Pax Americana and Pax Europea, basically saying that these two actors actually engage differently with the world. And when you define the differences, you can read them there, but there is this claim that actually, in war, on another way, European Union is offering sort of postmodern alternative of engagement with the world, especially in the South, which is different than the one offered by the US. The problem with this research, which I found very interesting and to certain points compelling, is that often offers compare the UN US engagement in the places where they didn't have the same interest. Case in point, Latin America. The European Union doesn't really care a lot about what's happening in Latin America. And there are different different cases. So coming back to my research question, I said, OK, but if we take the neighborhoods where both actors have been harshly criticized by their neighbors and by the scholarly literature, how similar and different orders they were trying to build. And I took the departure point in 2014 because that's actually the first time when we can speak about US regional strategy. US has been engaged in Latin America, as most likely you know, for many years. But we couldn't find a document on regional vision until very late 2014, Obama administration publishes Central American strategy. You know what's happened in 2014 and why, partially why, this strategy has been built. Unaccompanied minor crisis. And what's interesting, in 2015, European Union reviews its neighborhood strategy, partially relating it with the migration flows from the South, severe and refugees crisis. So, okay, that's an interesting point to take it into consideration, and let's look what they're trying to do there. So, one way to look at the regional order, how, how we define order. So, order actually can be a story. Because the regions are being built by the way how, you know, powerful actors, but also states of the regions, are telling, are understanding them. So, basically, this imaginary element. And in my research, this is one article I worked on, and this is something that I, for the curiosity sake, called it expanded the timing until 2021. I used the concept of strategic narrative, and then compared the strategic narratives of neighborhoods proposed by the European Union and the United States. And strategic narrative is sort of an oriented story where I'm trying to convince you that my solution for the problem, or my definition of the situation, is the best. So it's a story that I'm telling about three things. So first of all, it's a story that I'm telling about how the world is built, who I am in the world, and what's the problem and how I'm going to solve it. And I'm trying to sell you the story to myself and to you. So the stories we tell both to us and to, us, uh, and to the others. And also these stories have three uh, sort of elements. We're explaining what has happened. We're giving sense to what has happened. 
We are explaining what we're trying to escape from, and we're explaining where we are trying to get. So we sort of looked at the strategic documents published from 2014 to 2021 through this three levels and trying to see how the rupture, disorder, and order has been defined. So what can we really say that 2014-15, if you look at the strategic documents, uh, there has been a feeling of a rupture. So the migrant crisis, you know, you saw the pictures in the press, etc. especially the fact that the children has been involved, uh, caused sort of consternation. But when you look at the strategic document, uh, the emphasis on the rupture was not, I know, the responsibility or, or any of this humanitarian aspect of the crisis, is that something needs to be done. Because otherwise, we will feel the consequences. So we, by the US, by the European Union, for the European Union, it was an hour by the region has become unstable. So there is this feeling of rupture, which is really not felt in the later on documents. If you now would look at the 2021 US strategy, <laughs> do you know, by the way, how the 2021 US strategy for Latin America or Central America is called? Roots migration strategy, but I can come back to the roots of migration. So the interesting part of this feeling of the rupture is that the way how the US and EU described order and disorder was pretty similar, to be honest. The key similarities were that if you read through the documents, both in 2014, 15, 16, and 2021, the neighborhoods are painted as a source of insecurity. And this insecurity comes to our interdependence. We are connected to each other, we are interdependent, so we are insecure. We are very dependent on what's happening. And the key concept there is the roots of insecurity. That's why I'm talking about the root of migration strategy. So these roots of insecurity are not only security related. So all the aspects in our southern neighborhoods are dangerous. Demographic bonus, danger. Lack of employment, danger. Corruption, danger. So like all these fears, they become sort of manageable, changeable, etc. There are certain differences. So for example, for Donald Trump administration, there was this justification that we need to engage with Central America, Latin America, because the competitors are in their region, China, namely. And European Union, it's interesting, and here I'm not entering into that, is about the fact that European Union is regional. China, power with a strong emphasis on Mediterranean. So when Mediterranean goes bad, the European Union, little bit, if you read the documents, like our whole project is questioned. We are failing as a power that's not happening for the US. But that's a slightly different story. But when we look at the order as well, we'll find that the prescriptions, like the strategic documents are built like prescriptions. We're saying, you know what? We know how to solve the problem. We know how to fix you. You just need to do these reforms of the government's corruption, uh, competitiveness, employment, etc., etc. So a little bit like becoming like us, and we can help you to do that. There is a roadmap how we can help to do that. What is interesting in terms about the order and disorder is that uh, U.S. is way more optimistic about its ability to transform Central America. So this is a quote from Biden's Open Ed, uh, because Joe Biden, being vice president, wrote Open Ed sort of pushing the public opinion towards the sense, that com confronting these challenges requires nothing less than systemic change in our sovereign neighborhood. Uh, European Union, honestly, after 2015, does not want no systemic change. It's had to stabilize. So like, we will not transform, we will stabilize the neighborhood, and that will be better. But in any case, we can talk about the narrative of the neighborhoods as being disordered places that were on another way we need to order, and the rupture is very much related with that migration crisis. Another way is how I approach the question, and the way I'm searching the answer actually now, that's something I'm working on now, is through looking at the regional orders as systems. So bear with me, now we are getting like, <laughs> you can think technical and legal way, but now we're getting to the ER a little bit. So I said, okay, how do we define region? Okay, but that's one thing that you're talking blah, blah, blah about region. But how to understand what kind of region you are trying to build? And to answer the question of what kind of region, I'm coming back to the differentiation theory theory that comes from sociology, which basically says that any system can be described by how its parts are related to each other. So on the one hand, all the parts may be equal. So we all are human beings, we have basic human rights, in that sense we're equal. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, we can differentiate parts of the system by their status. We have professors here, and we have students. We have the same human rights, yet the status is different. And finally, there is the most interesting case of the so-called functional differentiation, 
when inside of the system, on the one hand, we have functions appearing, so I'm giving the speech. You are yawning, for example, and then we have different functions there. Or in the terms of region, for example, we have subsystems emerging. So for example, in the region, you can have economic integration, uh, you can have security integration, and different, different spheres. So what I'm saying, the first type of differentiation, this equality egalitarian, doesn't matter because it's heterosporibus, spurious, because formally all states are states, unless someone converts something. But formally, we're talking about the states as sort of being equal. Yet in the reality, each regional system can be placed in the matrix of two continuums. One of how vertical it is, in the simple sense, and the other one how horizontal it is, which sounds like a contradiction, but actually what I'm saying is it can be somewhere there. And to see how vertical it is, I'm asking basically how pushy the regional power is. Does it want to change its neighbors? And what does it do to change them? And one of the functional set, when I'm saying that it's important how the regional power enters into the region, how much regional goods it produces, and does it lead to the creation of regional institutions and sub-institutions. So what I do in practice at the very end, and I'm doing it, I have done it for 2014-17, and now I'm working to extend it, and we'll be coming back here, is that in terms of vertical, the US and EU are similar. We want to change our neighbors. We fund them being changed in the very same spheres, which has become like us. We have sticks and carrots, but until Donald Trump, even the US was not willing to use sticks. We use more carrots than beating up directly. With the Donald Trump, that would change, I'll come back a little to that. And they both try to paint that our regional strategies are jointly built, which is a little bit more true for European Union, but US with Obama tried to say that the Central America agreed, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the real difference is that in the blue sphere, when you look at this functional or horizontal differentiation, actually the European Union really feels a part of the Mediterranean. It really funds way more things inside of the region, and what is important, coming back to the migration a little bit, that it creates these formats for joint challenge management, so the migration, uh, different forums like Rabat Process, Valletta Process, Khartoum, etc. There's economic integration sphere, so this attempt to sort of build a region something that the US is not doing. And the change with uh, Donald Trump to say that in 2017-21, and I think Joe Biden would come back where Obama was, that migration so strongly dominates all the other spheres <laughs> that the US becomes extremely pushy saying, you know, we'll not give you money if you will not hurt migrants. We'll not do that if you will not accept migrants. So that becomes a very, very aggressive stance towards its neighbors, and actually it gives less for the region. So it's like, you know, we will, we will move out. Whereas the European Union actually is getting softer and softer in their discourse in terms of discourse, the practice, that's a good question, and what my colleague said about immigration management, for example, that one interesting thing, with this emphasis on differentiation and cooperation, etc. <laughs> so conclusions from this and how we can get to, 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 to the migration. So can we talk about the Western vision or Northern vision, actually, of Southern regions? Yes, we can. Uh, there is the source of disorder. We see like EU and US paint their sour neighbors as a source of disorder that requires to be ordered. And migration is a very important thing. And there is this interdomestic issue that used to be terrorism for the US uh, drug trafficking that sort of on the one hand is a trigger and on the other hand sort of transmitter of this disorder coming to our ordered society. So it requires this response. Can we talk about differences between regional Pax European and Pax Americana? Yes, we can. In terms that uh, EU is changing its stance, it really supports more institutionalization of the region and, and different things which are not related to the topic of today. But I think important to say that it's not in realms how we see migration and how we perceive the other. And a little bit coming back to what, what has been said today, it's the exercise of the othering that is important and is happening there. And we should not be, on the one hand, very uh, naive about the neighborhood. Sorry, my 15 minutes, however. Uh, in terms that there are serious challenges, both in Northern Triangle countries and in Mediterranean countries, that EU and US may help to address. And on the other hand, I am good from Eastern Europe. My country has been transformed by the European Union. Thank you very much. We've been transformed a little, transformed a little bit more. We are good with that. So there is this tension in development cooperation and how we see development and undevelopment. But when we talk about migration or build migration policies, we have to understand that 
in that context, there's a huge exercise of othering the places where the migrants are coming from. And that matters both ways, of how we understand migration, but also how we relate with our neighbors. And that's something what I think it's, it's important what you are asked to bear in mind. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva, for this uh, very, very interesting presentation. Well, now it's the time for, for you guys, for your questions or comments, so feel free to go to the microphone and start. So, hello. Uh, my question was, I guess, because all three of you pretty much had the central issue. To me, what I heard was the central issue being uh, accountability, whether it be at the individual level, the country level, or the international level. So how does that, account, <laughs> the account, accountability, how should that be placed so that the individuals, the countries, the international, like, how are those, how should that be managed to better get these levels to be accountable for their actions to make sure that migrations, immigrations handled better, refugees handled better, and all asylums handled better? All right, I'm gonna give this a shot. Um, sorry. <laughs> I've just gone into the blonde thing, sorry. Um, so in terms of accountability, at least in the legal field, it's important to distinguish one uh, between accountability and legal responsibility. Accountability being a lot broader and could be in terms of accountability towards parliaments, et cetera, or political institutions, whereas legal responsibility really entails going to courts and being able to enforce some form of a right and being able to access, access uh, reparations of some sort. To be accountable, uh, or to be legally responsible, my, and my, my take on this is that you would have to know what you're being held to account for. And I think one of my biggest issues within the field of border management, asylum, and migration is that there's so many actors involved, a lot of whom don't actually know what they're being held accountable for. So when we go back to Nova Plumo, for example, very clear what the positive and negative obligations are that attach to states. So a state knows we cannot use our police force or border guard or whomever to push back individuals into another territory. But that same obligation can't attach to an international organization, which is actually just a legal construction, right? Um, Though same way, and allow me to be a bit morbid here, if you know I kill someone with the assistance of an individual child, uh, the way those obligations or the way that I will be held criminally responsible will differ from uh, the way that the child would be held criminally responsible because they're just two different entities. And as far as you know, my field is concerned, what I see is that we don't actually have clarity on what obligations concretely the EU, for example, is bound by in respecting human rights law, nor do we have very concrete, uh, and we're getting there, not all sad, you know. Um, but we don't have a clear definitive view yet on what the concrete obligations are that attach to businesses or private corporations that are involved in this. Uh, so my answer in short to your question would be in order to be accountable, you have to know what you're accountable for. And that, I think, is flagrantly missing. I think the tools of our arsenal are Yes, yes, 
yes, let's say you pick the country, pick the tragic group of interest, um, and then when it's time to actually do the work, when it's actually time to do the long, think of how long it takes you to produce a paper or to get through a semester of work, and still you've mastered to a degree, but you really haven't. Well, if you, um, I think of, for example, the mentally ill, it's a lifetime job. It's not something that's exciting, and it's someone who one day tells you another, and the next day some insanity is happening, and the thing is that's not um, when legitimacy of systems. When people don't understand, uh, when they are processed because, for example, everybody thinks everyone in Mexico speaks Spanish. No, there are indigenous communities within Mexico that do not speak Spanish, but yet we process everyone from Mexico as a number. And the thing is, when you dehumanize, when you otherize someone into a statistic, into a file, and the thing is, how do we individually fight that? And not just by voting, but by getting other people to vote, by getting other people to act follow up and hold decision makers accountable. Uh, because it's easy for people in the machine, uh, in the political and the legal machine, to process numbers. And the truth is they win because there aren't enough people holding these individuals accountable. Yeah, I think it was so much for really insightful presentations from each of you. I have a couple questions for each of you individually, so please bear with me. Um, my first question for you, uh, Professor uh, Juan Carlos Gomez, I, I heard you bring out, and as, I meant, as you mentioned now, accountability and the individual's um, impact you mentioned that there is a lack of lawyers to really address each of this, these cases that are accumulating up at the border. But as you, you mentioned this system of really just processing tickets through, um, it seems that the uh, unaccompanied minors crisis has made the system kind of seem like they're really just processing this without any thorough I don't know, that's the problem, the lack of resources. I'll give you the situation. Two humanitarian actions were taken. You have the Wilfer Force Act, and you have the Flores uh, Settlement. The idea was, how do you process unaccompanied children in a humane way? How do we deal with migration of certain populations that would not normally fit the pattern of a refugee definition? And what happens is that, A, there were resources for a certain amount of time, but B, the intention of there was a conflict between what lawyers who are legitimate lawyers, and by that I mean that they tell the truth to the client, they tell people this is what we're really facing, and then sort of people who say, I'm going to bring my nephew, I'm going to, it, Remember that the person who needs help is the person who's smart enough and who has the resources to need help, not the person who is most vulnerable. You will find in populations across the world that the neediest were not the ones who left. It's those who had someone who helped to get them out. It's usually if it's a child, it's the, okay, you're coming with me or I'm sending you. Now, the thing is, though, that there's also human trafficking. But in, if you think of the, situ the cartel situation, you mentioned the unification of Italy. There is this interesting map of Mexico that looks like pre-unification Italy. And it's an amazing thing, because these cartels enslave people, enslave children, enslave homeless children, enslave populations. And the thing is, though, that one of my favorite jokes now is that we find ourselves in the situation of arguing against the government of El Salvador, not because of its usual long series of human rights violations, but now we're arguing on the human rights of gang members. And so, very, that it, I 
changes the solution. That's one of the tragedies of the situation. But the question is, there's a lot. We, we can't simplify it, but the thing is still that with the unaccompanied minor, here we are in 2023, and we have cases from 2012. And what do we do with them? What do we do with the dreamers? Because the Supreme Court, we see that there's an attempt to challenge the very concept of how to protect these, they weren't in a company necessarily, but children who were brought to the US, but the Supreme Court is no longer the Supreme Court of the 1980s. And so you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, who will end up in a worse situation. Do we have the political will to address this? Understanding that there's a counter argument, because once people are in the door, there tends to be a tendency of close the door behind me. It's the same thing as homeless people. Oh, I, I'm not saying, oh my God, I don't know that, okay, okay. Let me not open the window. Or if I can have dollars, let me not buy it. You can buy a dollar menu, but you're not gonna spend like a few. But how do we solve all of these issues by being conscientiously engaged and involved? That's what I would say. But it's a very long answer. No, if I can follow up with, I find it interesting that you bring up the idea of really turning this back to diasporas. And I wanted to, as you mentioned in your presentation, you talked about Miami specifically, and you mentioned the migrant communities that make up uh, our community, Venezuelan migrants, Cuban migrants, Nicaraguans, and Haitians, excuse me, of course. Well, you also have um, some Jordan, Guatemalan, uh, you have Jamaicans, and it's an interesting thing. These happen to be the four of the day. Uh, it's sort of the, the specialty of the day, if you will, because these tend to be the more critical. They tend to be on, in the news at the moment. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, we had a funny situation because there's a joke amongst the conservative anti-immigration movement that you can't trust anyone south of Palm Beach County because we all tend Immigrant. And the answer is, I, I don't understand, and the answer is that you cannot even develop coalitions of people who you would think would want to work together to help each other and to help others, <coughs> and yet we don't. And I can tell you that this isn't unique to Miami. You speak to colleagues around the world and you go, wait, you think I can solve this case in a few days? You all have this in Spain, I know, because my colleagues, like you, it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's like, what do you think? This is gonna take us years to solve. Not to mention that we need to find a law that will fit. And so, it's messy. The thing is that people want what I call Domino's Pizza. I'm not a commercial. Uh, but I tell people, you wanna call back for me within half an hour? Are you kidding? Do I just have Domino's Pizza to eat? No, 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 I'll get back to you. And the issue is that sometimes there isn't a quick answer. Because the thing is that you have entire populations. It, it's history. It, it's, it's just part of the process. But the question is, do you fit people into the language or the jargon of an accompanied minor? Do you fit people into the jargon of refugee law? Do you fit people into family or employment base? And the answer is, no, so all those others are the ones that are in a limbo. And we are stuck in a way trying to figure out because there's another side that would just really not mind keeping people in oppressive uh, situations, including <coughs> members of the same community because people don't just oppress themselves. Uh, I always love it where people come from a certain country Surprised, no one belonged to anything in either. I mean, Mr. Maluto was protesting against himself. I said, uh, yeah, Granados was protesting against himself. I said, okay, come on, let's not be absurd. There's a system in different places, and how do we accept? Because we have to hold persecutors accountable. But yet we, no, 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 not my nephew. My nephew was a saint. As a matter of fact, the Canada Commission Mass is scheduled for this. And it's not, that's not true. People do commit crimes. People do persecute. <coughs> How do 
do we hold those people accountable? How do we hold corruption accountable? I didn't quite think it worked. But how do we hold the corrupt accountable? You know how much? And the Honduran presidency comes with two, two suitcases full of cash. Am I wrong? Prove me wrong. Sure, many uh, elections or many presidencies around the world come with a lot more, maybe less overly. But um, I want to follow up on something that to finish the question on the um, diaspora. But I am gonna just shoot out the other two questions, um, and then I'm gonna come back to you really quick. I'm um, just like let me show my state of it. But um, Dr. Joyce McCormick, um, in your presentation, you brought up the issue that is facing um, Poland and Belarus with the migrants prior to, um, as we approach this year into the Ukrainian conflict, um, it was all over the headlines how these migrants were brought over between Lukashenko and Putin um, by convincing Afghans that they are going to be granted access entry into the European Union. So as you bring up and talk about Operation Sophia and the dangers that there are, um, it seems, between the muddying of the waters between non-governmental institutions, um, private corporations, it seems like there wasn't much meant to mention about the potential dangers that technology has, especially automated technology as we quickly approach the future. Um, so how much do you really think that that needs to be um, expanded on in those terms? Um, but also back to uh, the Afghan migrants, what, what kind of uh, policies or institutions need to come up to hold other out external leaders accountable for doing things like this? I mean, we're seeing the same kind of practice in the United States, in the state of Florida, with uh, Governor, whatever his name is, and the other one from Texas. <laughs> Um, and then uh, my question to Dr. Yeva. Um, I might, pretty quick, my question is in your presentation about um, the, the, the two powers. Um, Europe mostly was brought up and, and has earned this idea of being, in a sense, more uh, feminine, perhaps from Venus, because it is nurturing, because it provides so much social um, institutions for its citizens, how much of that really comes from influence from the United States, and why don't we see that? Um, and also, do you think that perhaps expanding more of the influence or more of uh, the reach in these places makes it more uh, conflicting for these territories to really kind of, you know, self-sufficiency? So yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. Okay, so what I heard, and tell me if I'm wrong, is two questions, right? Um, yeah. To what extent do we take into account technologies and AI uh, within border management and the whole question of responsibility and allocation of responsibility? And then the second question being, how do you hold external actors responsible for their contributions? <laughs> Back to the former, um, that's actually why I'm trying to develop this relational human rights responsibility model uh, because AI inevitably is going to be, or uh, the new technologies are inevitably going to be produced, manufactured, et cetera, by private. So instead of focusing on the whole AI aspect as such, because much of the research is now, will it violate yes or no, and I think inevitably it will if you've got automated you know, border management based on if there's this thing going on now where they're gonna like assess emotion, do emotion detection software if your account for asylum is credible or not. I mean, inevitably there's gonna be human rights violations there. But what you know, determining whether there is or isn't a human rights violation doesn't address is how you hold and who you hold responsible for when that violation occurs. So that's why I moved towards this relational model where you focus also on private corporations. So I can step away from the whole question about will it or will it not violate human rights and instead focus on who you hold responsible when it does. Um, so that's one. And then two, how you hold uh, external actors responsible. I mean, this is obviously a heated, uh, controversial topic. Uh, the other day I was in a meeting with the European parliamentarian um, because I'd asked us to write some reports about human rights clauses and trade agreements and pretty much the same question arises, right? what extent can you export European human rights values or international human rights values uh, to third parties? Um, and if they don't abide by those human rights values, how do you then hold them to account? And that's an unanswered question. I think one of the ways to go about that is sanctioning, but we've now seen with Ukraine-Russia, doesn't really work. 
I mean, one of my teams right now, one of my student teams, they're part of this like World Cup version for you know lawyer mood courts. Um, they're now actually uh, working with arguments where you hold aggregate san sanctions together in one big melting pot, and you hit you know a, a third party immediately with all of them, as opposed to doing this staggered sanctioning of Russia, as we've seen, which doesn't seem to generate anything. But in terms of have, providing you with a conclusive answer, I don't have one. Um, that's why I have students and their creative brains. <laughs> Look at them for creative solutions. Yeah, so I, I like a little bit to take this question also about this foreign, uh, like this Belarusian border, because actually I'm Lithuanian, so it's not only Polish, Belarus, it's Lithuanian Belarus border, and we have quite a side in our border, to be very honest. But it's a super complex case, it's also because, um, and it's not only Belarus, because Turkey has done that. Morocco is doing that constantly. It's uh, interesting that Mexico seems not to be doing that. Uh, it maybe says something good about Mexico. Uh, but the, and I don't like to use this term because the terms are very important, but we use it in the day-to-day -day parlance is weaponization of migration. <laughs> That's a horrible thing because for the one hand, you're totally dehumanizing people. But on the other hand, uh, well, Lukashenko said uh, when the first migrants were brought to the border and they were accepted, I said, like, don't worry, I'll bring you more. So obviously that affects the public opinion inside of the country, leading to this very harsh stance, and it's a super difficult question how to do that. But, uh, yeah, so I, I think, but I think we'll be coming back to the first question, we're talking about the global governance, migration, climate change, uh, sovereignty, justice, these are global questions that should be addressed somehow, some of you most likely will have to do that, because we'll be at by the time. Uh, that's some of the risks. Yeah, uh, and about the European Union is, uh, it's, it's, I think, the feminine uh, features assigned to European Union in Cartus, Cartus does not reflect the question of nurturing. That reflects weak. That's about weakness, Europe being weak, Europe having no teeth, etc., which is partially true. That's why you hear Lukashenko, Erdogan, or uh, the king of, of Morocco that's pushing European Union instead of someone pushing the US. Yet uh, it's you know it's it's this very cocky way from the real school. If you don't have enough uh, nuclear power, then you're weak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that's cool. it's not about nurturing and being more social, socially oriented. I would say so because usually in the debates that. Uh, but what does it mean for the EU engagement with the regions? Why I'm emphasizing the regional formats because I believe that this creation of regional sub formats that the EU is really doing is leaving a little bit more space for the neighbors. So to be honest, actually, if you can go and put on the table and negotiate you know, with your neighbors and, and have union for Mediterranean to implement some projects, it's different than the US a little bit, like directly mainstreaming its policies to the Central you know, America and, and do that. And, 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 you know, they don't do that, but, but it's a little bit different. Yet, uh, there is the whole question of how we do development cooperation and how we engage the global north with the south and our development cooperation, transformation, etc., etc., and the question of sovereignty, sustainability, <laughs> and it's an open question. There's no, again, there's no answers. We have students to answer those questions. Uh, but it's a tension because on the one hand, uh, there are money that can help, there are ideas that can help, but there's power and equalities and asymmetries that are affected. So it, it's complicated. Yeah, I apologize about my presentation. Don't forget that you kind of talked about the fact that you know, governments around the world, especially like established governments, like stable governments, want to like take like less stable governments, like in the global south, and kind of like transform them or you know like help them be more stable. So I wanted to ask you overall, like it's no secret that globally there's a trend of mistrust in governments and institutions, uh, especially when it comes to the fact of like immigration and weaponizing it, like you said. There's no longer that like blind trust in institutions. So. How would one or a country or an idea go about in changing or restructuring the system in weak states? If I would have an answer, I would give a Nobel Prize like immediately. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a very damn difficult question because when you speak about Sahel, for example, or when you speak about Northern Triangle, what you say about Honduras, their former president is now in, in jail, actually. I mean, he's a drug trafficking. Uh, but so the weak states are, are a problem. 
uh, and we don't know how to solve the problem because when we say we solve the problem, we also leave out the agency of those people who, who solve their own states. Uh, but at the same time, the global system is enmeshed in that way that you have European companies in, doing mining in Central America. Uh, European companies <laughs> in certain African countries uh, doing business and hiding taxes. We have our geopolitical interests when we support dictators that are our dictators. We want Morocco to keep our migrants. I mean, uh, so I think that the first part is a little bit maybe to uh, be more sincere about that and to help on the recipient terms. That's a concept from development aid, to help on the recipient terms, discussing and looking. But it's really not easy. It's not that willing to transform its neighbor is bad. You know, it's not. It comes from the dynamic, but it's really important how you do and how you approach it. questions so I, I suggest this probably we can listen to the three questions and then we do a kind of round of answers. Okay? I just have one final question. Okay. As an immigrant, as someone holding a CV as being a Venezuelan person here in Miami, um, I get to see things that you know people in Washington DC or you know like government officials don't really like take into consideration. So with this issue of perspectives and you know living the other side of the story, being a migrant yourself like how do we stop injustices from happening within the migrant community because like we mentioned mm -hmm. there's many people out there willing to take advantage of us they willing to say oh if you come if you make it the right way we'll give you like anything or whatever you ask for how, how can we as you know civilians as people who live in, in you know like the states that are taking in these migrants how do we go about stopping that how do we go about you know like demanding better treatment of these people speak up that's the answer do not let and Coral Gables and Pinecrest and mostly these women are working as slaves for money that is just not a wage. They're threatened of with conditions related to their families back home. And the answer is how do you speak up and 
how do you correct people who remind them that these people have a mouth and a mother? They eat and they have a mother who hopefully loves them. And the thing is, so that it's an amazing thing because I, I see it, I see it constantly where people focus just on what is familiar to them and it, are not aware of all the other individuals and groups who are marginalized, who are otherized. And how do you do that? Because most people, uh, I'll give you the example of Guatemalans. Guatemalans and Salvadorans, they don't have the voice. They don't have the political power. Those with political power, they're still individuals there are going to face problems, but there's a stronger presence. Um, the Venezuelan community is interesting because the Venezuelan community should be more unified, but it's not. And this is why the injustice is continued. How do we create unity? Not that we all have to think alike, uh, but that, that everybody helps to protect the other. So let's listen to us two questions and then we can answer them. So I'm a little biased too because I'm Hispanic, right? So I think of culture as something very important to the individual, right? Something that, not that no one can take it away from you, but culture is so individual and so part of you that when you migrate to somewhere else, there's a tendency to assimilate, right? There's a tendency to get rid of your own culture. So I have a little bit, it's a short, not simple question. Can assimilation, ever be good and if it can't then how can we stop it? it's short but it's not in, there's some nuances but let's see I, anyone can answer good afternoon um my question is actually for specifically uh, mr juan carlos gomez you talked earlier about the diaspora and you mentioned haiti and i was kind of curious if you could talk about the current situation in haiti and kind of if the diaspora is maybe adding on to the problems going on, because I understand that there is essentially no government in Haiti at this point. Like a lot of the government entities here in the United States are essentially saying that there's no government over there. Is the diaspora making the situation any worse by supporting the people or making it so that there is, in a sense, no need for a government and then there's just this continued lawlessness? Too, too broad. Uh... Thank <laughs> you. 
part because it had ruined the one place that I used to get tea coffee, and in part because if I just don't understand this Disney World approach to culture. Don't come for a record to kill you. Uh, and the thing is that, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, why, you want me to wear a sombrero and cut your mom? What the hell? Do you see what I'm saying? Would you like me to be Ricky Ricardo? I mean, do you see, there are, there's an actual survey of, of that, they were asking people about influential Hispanics in the United States. Existed a fictional character from the 1950s as an influential, Ricky Ricardo as an actual influential person in the United States, are you kidding me? And that's the level of ignorance. So how do you fight that? Can you fight that by not being silent? Never be silent, because going back to the AIDS crisis, uh, silence is death, and silence is oppression. I still have the short and complex question. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to actually address your question in combination with your original question as well, um, and then maybe tie it back to something that was said in an earlier presentation today. So um, I agree, communication is key. And on that note, a uh, small anecdote when I was in my second year of law school, um, I was stopped on the street and I was asked, Do you know what your fundamental rights are? Lo and behold, I did not know what my fundamental rights were. Um, and it took me, you know, an additional degree or two, and then my PhD to really understand what my human rights are. And it, you don't need to be a legal scholar to understand that. So educate yourself, and I don't mean that in a derogatory manner whatsoever, but educate yourself about what your rights are, because there is an entire legal framework out there that you know could help in pushing forward more equal treatment of individuals across the globe, but it's not being utilized. When I came to the US last year, and you know, you introduce yourself as a human rights scholar, they're going to laugh at you. They're like, oh, human rights are ineffective. Well, it's going to be ineffective if you don't know what your bloody human rights are. So if anything, communicate and educate, and then communicate your educated stance on human rights law so that you can use that for the benefit of the communities that you're trying to protect. On the note of language, why did I go into law? Um, math would work. Depending on how you use your terminology, you will create a different legal outcome, which may or may not work to your advantage in safeguarding those human rights, right? And so be critical about how you position yourself as an individual uh, when you're engaging in this type of discourse. It was funny because the question that was asked, how do we fight and combat uh, anti-immigration rhetoric? And I was I was baffled by my own perspective on it because I think the, the mere reference to fighting and combating inevitably reduces the conversations to this dichotomous approach to migration, right? It's either this or that. There's no room for nuance. And if anything, this is going to sound like such a hippie thing to say, be kind and curious, <laughs> and add the nuance to the debate. Make sure that in, when you're dealing with somebody that is uh, you know, blurting out some anti-immigration rhetoric, that you ask where that's stemming from. Because quite frequently, my opinion, it is stem from fear and lack of knowledge about what we're talking about. So those would be my two. So a little bit just, I think it's a relation to that, honestly. I think it's a long way. And I, I, I'm coming back to personal sort of anecdotes. So I'm from Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is a place where lots of linguistic and ethical groups were forced to co cohabitate. And then we basically killed each other and made nation states, uh, sort of in that way. Uh, and it's difficult to integrate people uh, in this state which requires you to assimilate. And that's one thing. So I don't think it's a good approach. I think we should learn something from this place. But talking about the migrants, and I think that's very important, again, coming back from personal experience. So we Europeans, Eastern Europeans, we had clean toilets in the West for, for quite a long time. And it's so funny that the same people who have migrated illegally, picked mushrooms, strawberries, whatever, uh, they consider themselves, they were angry about those posh Western Europeans that look them down, now are the harshest anti-migrants. So what I'm trying to say, don't get accommodated. It's once you get this legal status and you are okay, you're willing to close the doors to others. And that's super strong. It always strikes me, you know, because I talk sometimes to people who literally worked, you know, in, in UK illegally and now just just immigrants are coming to take much of it. <laughs> How can I explain it? But I think this empathy and education and seeing the other as the other with whatever complexity it is. Especially in migration is a huge thing, and it's also for ourselves. And the moment, you know, when we have the paper, when we have the recognition, what do we do with this recognition? Are we closing the doors for others? 
and sadly, what I see is not. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Joyce and Yeva, for this fascinating panel. Uh, thank you for staying. We are going to have a break now. We are going to be working at Tukian for our last panel on so, uh, civil society responses. So, well, enjoy and thank you very much.